I for, did I forget something? I don't know. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah. I'm always so nervous when I do this. Like, in general, it's like, I don't, like, readings make me nervous, and I think this one makes me particularly nervous. But here we are. All right. Um, first, thank you all for coming. Uh, of course, thank you uh, to the team who uh, we always are sure to thank at the beginning of these. Leah and Adam and Gwen and Travis and all the staff. Uh, yeah, y'all are great. This is like truly one of the joys of my year every year that I get to come. Um, shout out to Marianne and my workshop. Um, yeah, y'all have been excellent. Um, it's been a real highlight. Um, all right, I'm just gonna read poems because I don't know what to say. Uh, all right, I'm just watching my time. Oh, okay. Uh, this, so this, I, I have no first cousins um, at all. Uh, so this poem is sort of about that. It's called Family Tree. Because my mother was an only child and my father was the only one of six to sow and reap, my first cousins are not by blood exactly. My first cousins are the kids on my father's block who invited us to their WrestleMania party every year for a decade. My first cousins are the trees, thick as hallways where we pissed in between basketball runs or counted for games of tag. My first cousins were the interlocking church chairs the last day in service before they got chucked for new pews. My first cousins are the two cent shoes bundled into 50 cent plastic pouches and peddled in basements that were kitchens and also stores. My first cousins were the training wheels my father removed and then reapplied when I decided I wasn't ready just yet. My first cousins were my mother's first cousins who one day might float into town carrying stories of me as a baby and declaring I call them auntie as deference. My first cousins were the wood chips we chucked at each other in between swing sets. My first cousins were the immediate ringworm you would get and pass like a secret if you were goofy enough to play in the sandbox. <laughs> My first cousins were the plates of food passed from house to house for every occasion, carried by whoever was youngest in one house to whoever was oldest in another. My first cousin was the basketball I made that littler kid drop the day of that drive-by when we were out there. My first cousin was that kid tucked into my also kid arm and ran into my grandma's house, spiked softly onto the carpet in between plastic wrap furniture like the truest touchdown in a tight game. Cool. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll read one more, then we're gonna sort of, I'll do sort of a different thing and then we'll keep going. Um, yeah, this poem's about my grandmother. Uh, m m so my maternal grandmother is kind of like an important figure in my life. She was really uh, kind of the person who put books into my hand first. She was a librarian. Um, and in many ways, it's kind of probably why I'm a writer, but she was also very nervous about the idea of me being a writer. Um, yeah, and so yeah. So this is called, In Her Last Days, My Grandma Worried About Me. She was dying. No other way to say it. The cancer was closing her throat, slowly like dripping honey. And one of her worries was me, a teen who loved to read, like she taught me. One of my best memories of her was when she took me to a hip hop jam at a downtown high school so I could try my raps for the real heads. I remember b-boys searching the corner closet for a chair so she could sit while I spit and they spun. She watched steady as a sun while we rotated. Anyway, I miss her. 
No other way to say it honestly. And every early September blows in that feeling of her dying while I was hosting a teen open mic. And when I got back and she was gone, I took off up the stairs and took down the welcome home banner and balloons we had hung only a day or so before. After the tears, my sister told me that she told grandma she would be an engineer and not to worry because even if Nathaniel is an artist, I won't let him starve. And it is true that I promised my grandma I wouldn't major in poetry, though I didn't promise not to major in English. And for the turn of phrase, I give praise. I do wonder if she lived, what would she think about my lecture on line breaks? I'm lying. I just wonder what thing that scared her would she love me through today? I just wonder what would she want me to name my daughter? Cool. Um, all right, so. All right, we're here. All right, so. Um, uh, so I'm from Chicago, uh, which some of you perhaps know if you know me. Um, and I left Chicago uh, probably about five years ago now, which is kind of strange. It, fe it feels like much longer and like yesterday. Um, but I'm, yeah, I moved away from Chicago, moved to Colorado at the time, which is not a place I live anymore, but hey, such is life. And um, the summer before I was moving, um, so this is like summer 2019, I had this commission to write an audio play. And so perhaps naturally I wrote this audio play that was actually about leaving Chicago. So it was kind of thinking about my own experience, but then also uh, really thinking about a sort of out migration that is taking place in Chicago and frankly a lot of sort of northern and western cities um, in which uh, specifically like black folks are leaving and going elsewhere and what have you. Um, and so I was sort of taking this moment in my own life to think about this broader thing. Um, yeah. Um, so I'm going to read, I think, a piece of that. Um, and I'm going to ask for help uh, from my nephew, Justin. Um, he's been sort of haunting around. Yeah, he's. So I guess like a kind of funny a kind of funny note about this thing is, this is like five years ago, he's 16. Um, he's very strapping and charming or whatever. And, um, and so, you know, five years ago, I wrote this thing and I wrote it, like there, there's the sort of main character and it's the day before he leaves the city and he's running errands and doing stuff and he keeps encountering people. One of the people he encounters is his nephew, right? But when I wrote this, I wrote the nephew as a 16-year-old specifically so that I would not make the character Justin. Um, <laughs> because I was like, I don't, it feel like, you know, I don't want to just be like, let's like rehash this relationship that I actually have in this sort of fictional thing. So fuck that up, um, whoops. <laughs> no, it's okay, but so yeah, so I wrote this thing like however many years ago, we were about to cast it probably like the day that COVID happened. And so it never really happened. So I don't know, I, we're just, you're just gonna hear a piece of it now. I don't know. So um, yes, uh, the, the main character, uh, Jay, who I'm going to read, uh, is a journalist. He's about to leave the city um, to take a job. He has a girlfriend who is also leaving with him. Um, let's see, what else do you need to know? Um, his nephew Malik is 16. And um, yeah, it's really, it's really uncanny. I like, hadn't thought about this. And um, we, find, we find them, he has just left. So this is like an actual real corner. There's a corner um, in the, on the far south side of Chicago um, where there's a high school, then across the street from the high school is a post office. And then um, right next to the high school is a police district. And so th this, this particular scene takes place kind of in that little triangle, uh, Jay is leaving the post office and yeah, and he, he encounters someone he does not expect to see. Um, I think that's, that's pretty much all the setup, isn't it? We good? I'm amazed. All right, cool. 
Um, all right. Oh, I guess the, the high school's called Morgan Park. Whatever. That, yeah. Good old Morgan Park. Ah. Ooh. Ah. Should have been a Mustang. Ooh. Ah. Should have been a Mustang. Ooh. Ah. Should have been a mu Dang. Malik, is that you? Malik. What up? You got it. Use the mic, dude. 16. We're, we're working it out. We're working it <laughs> What up, bump? Boy, what are you doing? Uh, uh, I was getting something from uh, Riot's principal. Yeah, yeah. Is you stupid or is you slow? What? I said, is you stupid or is you slow? Get your narrow behind up. Walk. And give me that. Police station right down the block, and you over here loud as a car alarm, goofy. I thought the governor legalized it. Yeah, and? That law ain't kick in yet. Well, you told me they decriminalized it in the city anyway. Yeah, but they ain't decriminalized your black ass. Now come on before you get us both caught up. All right, man, be cool. So what's this I hear about you coming home late and all this? I'm not fine. But you not grown. You can't just be running off like this, man. That ain't cool. I'm not going to be around here to keep chasing you every time. It's still summer, man. Anyway, like I said, I'm not fine. More than you can say. What? Are oh, you getting smart? Boy, don't get too big before I had to jack you up. Yeah, I'm right. I'm grown, but I'm not old. Your uncle still got it. <laughs> <laughs> uncle Jay, you really got to chill. You old. <laughs> Only thing you got is a disappearing hairline. <laughs> you got jokes. I got what I got. You need to get a job. Because <laughs> the only... Old J's around here is them old J's you got on your feet. You funny. Them old battle rap sounding jokes you got are kind of getting old, unk. You need to get some more new material. Them old battle raps are still bust show. Uh, nah, unk. I be doing my thing, you feel me? But you don't even know. What you old heads be saying? Right, I got bars. Yeah, you finna have more bars, you keep smoking 100 feet from a police precinct. Man, you know, hold on. Oh, my bad, my bad. Man, you not funny, Unc. Anyway, I was at school. How you gonna be mad at me for being at school? <laughs> you the main one always saying that thing. Damn, what, what is it? Oh yeah. A mind is a terrible thing to leave. You should be happy. I'm in school. The saying is, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. And I'm not the only one who says that. It's the United Negro College Fund slogan. And you better lay off the weed. It's already messing with your short-term memory, boy. Boy, that's a racist white term, huh? Boy, if you don't get out of here. You heard Quonsum that calls us Negroes. You problematic, Unc. <laughs> you better chill before you get canceled. I got your canceled. Anyway, you got your bus card? You got to get back home. <laughs> um, ain't you hungry, Unc? I am. I was about to slide down the home of the hoagie. I got you if you got your bus card. I got it, I got it, I got it. All right, come on. All right, we'll, we'll pause there. That's cool. All right, thank you, Justin. Appreciate it. All right. Cool. Very good. Um, <laughs> that's good because you, you can't boo because he's a child. Ha <laughs> ha. Tricked you. No, um, yeah. I was, I was actually looking at a chapbook that I wrote in college when he was like a very small baby, kind of about him. And I was thinking, and I, I told my, my workshop that, that I was sort of reading this thing. And they're like, you should read something from it. I'm not going to do that because it's like the poems aren't very good. And they're also pro Kind of probably embarrassing for both me and him, so no one benefits. Um, but I'll read more things. And I don't know, you got to see Justin. You're welcome. Here we are. All right. So 
the book I'm working on is, is just elegies and love poems. That's all I got for you. I got, we got elegies, we got love poems, uh, sometimes things that are both or what have you. Um, so I'll sort of bop around. Um, I'll read this. So this poem is called One Glove. It's after Elizabeth Bishop, One Art. Perhaps you know this poem. Um, and it's for um, a gentleman named Art Jimerson. Um, Art was uh, a boxer, and he participated in the first UFC, right? Um, Ultimate Fighting Championship. So, you know, y'all maybe have seen UFC, this sort of MMA, this like crazy kind of combat sport. Uh, but the original intention of MF uh, or of uh, UFC was this idea of if if fighters from a bunch of different disciplines fought each other, who would come out on top? And it was sort of an open question, right? Because no one had had really done this, right? What happens if you have a sumo wrestler versus um, a judo expert or what have you, right? Um, and so I read this thing about Art Jemerson, and it weirdly kind of moved me. And uh, this was in October, and so my October this past year was kind of like, I don't want to say strange, it, it was emotionally intense in, in a lot of ways, right? Um, so, so both kind of witnessing the unfolding horror in Gaza, and then one of my like, best friends, probably my, actually my oldest friend, uh, passed away very suddenly. Um, and then I also couldn't go to that funeral because my wife was very, very pregnant. She had a, we had a child in early November. And so I was sort of like in these multiple modes of waiting and watching and um, like a certain kind of imposed stillness. And this poem happened. Um, so this is One Glove After Elizabeth Bishop for Art Jemerson. The art of losing is damn hard if you're honest and care. I know her well. Look, I lost my glasses freshman year and existing in a country where healthcare is an industry saw the world fuzzy until I was near 17. I lost so badly once in a basketball game that the coaches thought it merciful to run the clock even when play stopped and the best opponent on that team ended up a legend, an MVP until he lost his knee. I lost in poetry slam after poetry slam after poetry slam every year of my teens, bringing my little verses like prayers to a wall or a church or a fountain, sprouting spirals of clear, lovely, wasteful water. I lost my friend who beat me in those poetry slams, and the loss unmoored me, unmade me, at the same time, a whole people who lost a land, lost their lives, and my government funded it and did not lose any sleep. For governments, the losing is not hard, but perhaps only because they are so hungry for anything that makes them master. Art Jemerson lost before the fight. He lost his boyhood, and then he lost this one famous fight and lost his reputation, and lost his shot at the title, and lost his ego, and in that losing found himself. This is an art, to lose and find anything in the losing. It is an art to know that losing the little physical trinkets, even the famous glove, is of little consequence. There is an art to knowing that losing sometimes, mean you had, sometimes means you had the courage to try or strength enough to endure the fight. Cool. Um, all right. So let's see. All right, I'll do like two more elegies and then a couple love poems and then I'll get out of your way. Cool. Um, this is Elegy for Funerals. Um, I sort of wrote this. Uh, kind of during lockdown and thinking about what it means for us to lose or have truncated or have, to, to be sort of separated from our grief rituals, right? Especially at, at this time um, with such profound grief, right? To not uh, be able to gather in some of the ways that we used to gather, so yeah. How many of our ways to say goodbye have we been denied? 
How many shiva stools sat empty because beloveds couldn't come or were already gone? How many caskets were left unfussed with no whalers to drape themselves over the departed like a pile of dirt? How many of us had to zoom into a forever farewell? How many made the final bath before the final shroud for a beloved more alone than they should be? How many prayers were said as solos by a chorus of mourners made to stay apart? How many came together to grieve, but the coming together passed the grief maker to its next work? How many spirits have splashed to the ground in honor of a new ancestor? How many corner-born promises have been made stronger and stronger? I put that on my dead homies, on my dead homies. So, so many dead homies. Cool. Uh, all right. Okay. So the next one is an elegy, um, but it perhaps is in a different register. Um, so, th and this is actually kind of a Sawani poem, so it's kind of cool. I actually, I don't think I've read this in public. So, uh, the I like to visit the cemetery over here. Um, I got a couple of friends over there that I got to check in with from time to time, um, including there's several poets, there's several like sort of well-known poets um, who are buried in there, um, and uh, including Alan Tate, right? Um, Alan Tate. Uh, is sort of best known for his poem, Ode to the Confederate Dead. Um, he also went to Vanderbilt University, which is where I went to undergrad, um, which is kind of a funny coincidence. Alan Tate would be very upset about that because he wrote shit like Ode to the Confederate Dead. So, you know, I don't know. He probably doesn't like I went to his school, but can't do nothing about it. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so this poem is, is sort of to Tate, um, or for Tate, as it were, and I guess all you really need to know, I'm think, I've been thinking a lot about like legacy and what it means to have um, a kind of legacy that you don't, to have like a complicated legacy, right? Um, and one of the, the things that I discovered in the last few years um, that I think also kind of led me into this poem was, um, so I went to Vanderbilt, which was sort of a random place for me to go from Chicago because my best friend, both of his parents went there and they sort of, said they would take me if I went on a trip. And so I went on the trip and then I liked it and I went. Um, what I didn't know is that uh, my friend's grandfather, I, I knew his, his grandparents had sort of also gone to Vanderbilt or whatever, um, but his grandfather explicitly went to Vanderbilt to study with some of the fugitives. Um, and so in a very real way, I don't end up at that school without um, this particular presence of these like, frankly, like very racist poets and that makes me chuckle. Um, so, yes, this is Fugitive Elegy for Alan Tate et al. I wander at the domain's edge to find the tomb I found before, a stone that's carved to tell the tale of Tate, his loving, loathing lore. Imagine me, a naive boy of northern birth and darker hue who haunted all your favorite grounds with what I have to say to you. You offered odes to your forebears who hoped to keep mine mired in chains. My, my, my mom would mammy now if your myopia won the day. I bet you think a lonely, a lowly black, unable to pin polish verse, and that my foe would be a foible. I'd forgive, I've been called worse. But peep, by which I mean come close and listen to my subtle song to mourn our dead, my people pour out drink for spirits gone too long. And so, when I sat at your grave, what did I bring? A wine or beer? A bourbon, maybe? Something from your home state that might bring you cheer? I did not, though you may forgive me. Or perhaps you maybe can't. Perhaps where you and your ancestors live now, you won't hear my rant. But if I take the maxim true that all who slave will go to hell and slavers include those who would but could not in their moment, well, then what I poured was welcome drink, or at least rather welcome spout. I do not hate you. If I did, I would not piss to put you out of burning, but you know I did while playing out a favorite tune, Gil Scott Heron's magnum opus, 
titled Whitey on the Moon. If you think my meaning crass or you believe my taunting vile, wait till you hear of all the things your heroes did to girl and child. I've seen the tropic sugar seasoned with the hands of hapless men. Your gentry planters fuck their captives and you know what happened then. Their seed made money for them like the harvest of a human crop and when they tried to flee, your fathers went and invented the cops. I feel no sorrow at your death. Your grave's a story, nothing more. If this is artless, call me back. I'm glad you fucking lost your war. <laughs> May you lose every war you fight, though I suspect you wouldn't fight. If often, it's often those who pose nostalgic who are cowards in true night. If piss that dripped onto your grave flowed down to you and seemed a flood, take heart, my fellow foulest door. My next libation will be blood. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. All right. I'm going to do like two more poems and then I'm out of your way. All right. Um, this has a long title. The title is Whatever, whichever singer or songwriter or old uncle who first came up with the phrase, go half on a baby, is terrible at math. <laughs> Not that the math is the point, but I'm just saying they surely went to the underfundedest of schools. This isn't a poem about the sad state of American public schools, but if I'm honest, all my poems are. One day, I was sad in a public school, and so I wrote a poem. It was called The Mountain, and it was for Hannah, who I loved as much as any third grader can muster, and my mama found it in my bag, and before reading, it was scared and fierce, and after reading, it laughed at my youthful hubris, and I cried and didn't write anything else down for years. Another time, in seventh grade, I failed the city math standards test by one point, and that meant I took algebra again in the next year. It was a magnet school and that class repetition made me know I was bad at math for life. The next year, the city eliminated the test for being confusing, but my life is still my life. In high school, I wrote whole rap albums and pre-calculus and took 15 minute bathroom breaks to record verses. My math was that of the 16 bar verse. I don't even have enough latent knowledge of a class I autopiloted through to make some topical turn of phrase. I just have raps and love poems. The only C I got on my college transcript was statistics. I retook it for ego and got a C plus. <laughs> this is beside the point or the decimal or the ones I can't carry. What I'm saying is seeing you grow every day makes it clear that I am much less than half of this equation. Divide 15 minutes or 30 seconds by 40 weeks. I am not sure if I set up that equation right, but let's go that fraction on making a little love of our little love. Cool. Um, yeah, I'll just, we'll, we'll just end with, we'll just do with this one. Um, Thank y'all. Y'all are y'all are so so kind. Um, yeah, this this poem. I guess all you need to know. This poem sort of references uh, the card game Spades, um, and this is an invitation. Anyone could get it at the French House. <laughs> Holler at me. What's up? We got we here. <laughs> all right. This is called Table Talk, and uh, yeah. All the wedding poems Hallmark collected our cap, all the movies on their channel too, all the ones who found ones and onlys are only fooling, actually not anybody. We know it, our parents parted before death and mine never even made the ill-fated promise. Look, even my grandparents called it quits. Look, even my great-grandparents were pioneer integrationist ensuring separation angst was not a broken covenant with a racial covenant. I'm saying though, one older brother told me his marriage was a chapter that was 
and is now done. Multiple have said, you ain't married till you married, then stared at me hard like trying to telegraph a bad hand in a spades game. <laughs> oh well, sorry to the old heads. Sorry to my generations of hope less romantics. Sorry to the old poets. I got a love thing, and if you looked it in the eye, it would confound you. It would seem suspect or unfamiliar. That's what makes me put my money down on it. Nil or nothing, Boston or bust, partner pathos, this making bored the whole game and still winning by a mile. Cool. Thank y'all so much. Um, please give it up. Uh, I'm very excited uh, for my fellow reader. Give it up for Liliana Padilla. so much, Nate. That was amazing. Justin, that was wonderful. Um, just, it's really good to be back. Um, thank you, Leah, Glenn, Adam, Travis, all the staff. Thank you, actors, for showing up and giving voice. Um, thanks to Nathan and to my workshop. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, and it's been just a really joy to be back and like get to connect with people that I've seen here before, um, and also new people. So that's, I don't know, that's special in a life where sometimes it can feel pretty transitory. Uh, this is an excerpt from a play called Twitch that is a very slow growing play that's sort of been haunting me. And it, I, I work on it just a little bit at a time. And I, I have no idea when I'll finish it. I kind of feel like I'm on draft 1.1. One. Um, but I shared a little bit of it years ago. So if you have a great memory, you might remember. Um, I wouldn't. Uh, but, uh, I uh, we're kind of going to jump into a, a part of the middle. And um, what's important to know is that Pam has a twitch. And she sits on a brown corduroy couch the whole play. And the light will never go out on her. She's on this brown corduroy couch. Um, in my dream version, the whole set is brown corduroy um, and faces are delineated by different um, stains on the sort of big metaphorical couch. Um, what else is important to know? Uh, Jill is looking for a missing person. Dog! And uh, <laughs> uh, there is a, a rehab center uh, in the town, this sort of uh, fictional town, which, which might open someday, maybe. Um, and Brittany, Xavier, and Sean will each play two characters. So when we meet them a second time, it's a different character. Oh, except Sean plays one character that recurs. But I think it's clear. We'll see. I don't know. You'll follow. Mm -hmm. Or you won't. Um, Okay, I think that's it. Thank you. <laughs> if you were to gaze into a drawer and everything is stacked one on top of the other, how do you feel? How do you find anything? This is like in a subway car at rush hour and laying one person on top of the other. You should roll your clothing very tight and orient it from light to dark inside your drawers. Your brain is happiest making fewer decisions. Your brain is happiest with symmetry. You are cueing your subconscious to feel very at ease. You are saying, I have established a sense of order. I have established a sense of order. I deserve the peace I have created. 
I deserve to pee for it. Every day I digest my life. <coughs> Every day I digest my life. <laughs> I decide. I decide what I want to incorporate I and what I want what to I want expel. To what I want to expel. I touch. Every object, every object I own. I own. Does this bring me joy? Does this, does this bring me joy? Is this part of the me I am becoming? Is this, is this part of the me I'm becoming? Is this an object my best self would own? Is, is this an object my best self would own? Do you do that, Pam? Do you do that, Pam? Do you do that, Pam? Uh, I, 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 uh, I tried to get my real estate license. Yeah. Uh, Pam, uh, I, I've lived in this town all my life, so, so I thought I'd be a good emissary. But it's so expensive, and all the requirements and the outfits. Anita said you could do most of the work from home, but that wasn't true, Anita. <laughs> I just like that. The thought of having the keys, letting someone into their future home, or watching them walk around and just dream. I think my son uh, was thinking of buying uh, a little house recently, his uh, secretary girlfriend uh, posted something on Facebook. She has a public account. I don't know if he did it, but uh, I'd like to send him a peach pie or, or um, like uh, a storage container or, uh, or a snow globe. I love snow globes. Don't you? Wouldn't even know, you know that uh, it was for me. Where do you think of these posters? I'm looking for Doug Lemons. Have you seen Doug Lemons? Doug Lemons! Yeah, they're good. Let's get about them. Your subject is clear. Okay. But maybe you should add a picture? Like, I don't know who the guy is. Is he from here? There are no public accounts. Huh. What about his yoga profile? Stock photo of the sun. Hmm. Could you draw something? I try. Yeah. Well, see what happens. Are you sure you want to use your real number? Why wouldn't I? People will call you. You, you could just get a burner. I want people to call me. Investigators said he had no family, not even a roommate. <sighs> it's 11. Are you going to work? I'm working right now. OK. This is more important than the yoga studio. People can check themselves in. Did you sleep? A little. Is this like idle? It is not like idle. At first I was like, why are the investigators questioning me? I don't know him. He's a stranger. But I've been thinking about it, dreaming about him. I'm the only one looking for him. And Jill sneakily looks through the bus station files searching for Doug. The attendant runs after Jill. You can't be in here. Ah! She flees. She goes home. An idea. The yoga studio. She goes to the yoga studio, types on the computer. If I went missing, I would want someone to find me. Emily Kapinski, Jenny Whelan, Doug Lemons. She writes the address down on a tiny notebook. She goes to his apartment, puts on gloves. She tries to pick the lock. She tries. She tries. Success! She grabs evidence in his apartment, his computer. She dumps the objects at home. Hi, Pam. H hi, Leonard. You want me to come in? Uh, right there's good. You can hear me? Crystal, you, you can hear me? Mostly. Thank you. Uh, you seen Dougie? can't really talk about Doug, Pam. I keep having these, these uh, feelings. Do you need more pills? Email my uh, nurse. No, no, no. Th th they're my, my intuitions, feelings. Uh, were you still giving him prescriptions? No. You lying? 
What was he taking? What do you want me to say? Your son hates you, Pam. He doesn't want to ever speak to you again. And, and honestly, I haven't seen him in a really long time either. Oh. At least two months. Uh, and his phone? Straight to voicemail. I left several. And, and he's not at the hospital or the morgue or the... Rehab center? Close. Maybe he got a new number, new life. Maybe he just got on a bus and thought, oh, I'll get off when I feel like it. Yeah. I want a new life. <laughs> Me too. Yeah? Sometimes, often, <laughs> sometimes. Do you remember that night uh, uh, we went to the cliffs and, and, and went past the, the, the no trespassing sign? And we crawled into the cave. There, there were these lights in the distance, fireworks. Uh, and, and we just, like, uh, smoked a ton of weed. <laughs> I think that was one of the best nights of my whole life. You remember that? No. Uh, the, the cave, the, the little craggly one. I, I, I was all, oh, my God, I'm going to die. I'm going to fall. <laughs> And you were like, Pam, you're, no, you're not. Just one foot at a time. Mm. You were so patient. Well, good. Do, do you remember that? I went there a lot with a lot of people. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> do you need any meds, Pam? Call my nurse. Oh, I'm, I'm good. Don't need any. Uh, stop dreaming. Well, then you do. Okay. Thank you, Leonard. Hypothetically, if a person were to give you their computer, if a, hypothetically, if a missing person were to give you their computer, one, give one their computer, would that be helpful? Could you pass the password? What? Huh? Oh, sorry, I, I didn't know you were on the phone. I couldn't see. Okay, I'll come back later. Uh, my my husband died. Uh, my, my my husband died because I, I was a terrible caretaker. If I'm being honest, I know my meat sack. I, I still made dinner, uh, steak dinner. He said, "Honey, I need you to hold on to the story of my life." You're supposed to give dying people what they want. So uh, so, I got flashcards. Uh, I made a, a memory house of him. Uh, his first lacrosse game. His first yellow card first red card, he was really aggressive. Uh, 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 first kiss, uh, every person he ever slept with. You sure you want me to be telling you that? <laughs> I said, honey, should I write this down? I, I, I can write this down. He said, no, 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 just keep it in your mind. I said, honey, when you die, I, I'm, I'm moving to Brazil and I'm going to get a young boyfriend on your military pension. He laughed. Ah! <laughs> I said, I won't possibly remember this with all those caipirinis. And he said, do your best. I want my story in something that lives, not hold up inside pen and paper, or worse, a floppy disk. I didn't have the heart to tell him that floppies had gone the way of the dodo. I whispered, honey, I, I'm not sure I'm something that lives. What? Nothing. Uh, what should I put in the kitchen? Please don't take this personally. I'm required to by law. I'm supposed to ask you questions on this form. Uh-huh. And where does that form go? Our files. And where do the files go? Are you in danger? No more than you. <laughs> well, uh, are you afraid for your life? Are you? Not in an acute way. I told you I fell. Uh, plus the PTI. Uh, Sorry, English. <laughs> Your eye. First blood vessels. Strong evidence of strangulation. My lover forgot our safe word. How about that? And I've got a blood condition, so you know, better safe than sorry. We were being cautious. That's good. Good to be cautious. These are standard questions. I don't want to get too graphic, doctor. It's my business. There's no such thing as too graphic. But sometimes the only way I can come, uh, you know, have an orgasm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, really hard. Uh -huh. 
like good hard, great hard, yep. is if I basically can't breathe. You know what I'm saying? You ever feel that way? I, no, not familiar. Um, have heard, of, read of, but no, no. We all deserve to feel safe at home. I agree. I want you to know there are resources. Thank you. And my prescription? Five days? It's plenty. I'll still be hurting in five there days. There are pamphlets on your way out. For a friend, maybe. Or for a crook. Craigslist is for home. Craigslist is for 2 a.m. Craigslist is for alone time, honey bear. Oh, sorry. Work hours, Jill. No one's here. Math smell, bamboo is wet, and I need you to do the mailer. Got it. Like now. Do you remember Doug Lemons with the almond bar? We sell a lot of almond bars. He'd always arrive late and would sit in the back. Yeah, no. I can't find him. Uh -huh. What? <laughs> Some people just stop taking yoga. It's not for everyone. It brings so much up. You should really take my class. God, if I started worrying about everyone who didn't come back, my God. You'll get it when you're older. Thank you. Um, I, I once went to this meditation retreat in India. Wow. And I started to imagine all the people in my life who are gone, melting. My attachments just melting away. Oh. It was so freeing. It was so freeing. You should try that. See, I think I'd rather find him. It's called boundaries outside of this space. Thank you. The cable guy is coming between uh, 10 and 6. A big window, huh? That's okay, I like waiting. I like waiting. Uh, it, it's just like, <laughs> it's just like. <laughs> it's just like when all the children in the town vanished. <laughs> and we were all, we were all, what should we do? What should we do? <laughs> Nell made some signs, and Anita started a fund. Uh, but where would the money go? Uh, Joey said he was a PI. <laughs> Joey is not a PI. <laughs> Joey is not a PI. <laughs> uh, I think it's 10.02. Who cares? I care. OK. He sold it to me. He's out of his mind. He can't sell things. He's losing his- I play the fuck out of Guitar Hero. I've beaten all the levels. <laughs> That's amazing. The patience. I go to sleep watching videos of Hendrix and King and Vaughn. You ever use Craigslist? No. I got my dog on Craigslist. Nice pet. You want to give him a cookie? Sure. He doesn't eat cookies. <laughs> He's not that kind of dog. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry to bother you. I'm sorry to interrupt your day. I'm just practicing. Cool, but my friend Doug Lemon is ill. He's not well. It's like buying a car from an infant. Told me I could take his dog, too. I didn't take his dog because obviously. Oh, God. Sage? It's a shitty name for a dog. Jill hands $10 to Veronica. Uh-huh. I'd like to buy it back. To the power of four and we got a deal. That's ridiculous. He wasn't even in his right mind, you know? That's evil to, to take advantage. Am I a psychiatrist? I don't know. Am I a psychologist? I don't know. I am not. I am a consumer, and he was selling his fine Fender American, and I bought it fair and square. You seem like an empathetic person. Why do you say that? I'll tell people you stole it. Yeah? And who are you? I'm his... What does that mean? Friend, like friend. The way you said it. My friend. Okay. Well, your friend is getting rid of his things, mama. 
trying to dump his dog. My God, you know what that means? Downsizing? Sure. Downsizing. You got bigger problems than finding me knocking on my door asking for a Fender American. A Fender American. Sound of a door slamming. Lights out on Veronica. Jill is blown across the room, a wind cave. Doug, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? There's a happy job. Happy place. People come smiling, leave smiling bigger, you know? No. Sorry. That was all your kernels? Your yes. kennels? Oh, no. I'm sorry. Nothing else? Yes. Well, no. <laughs> what? Shame. What? You're so bad at lying. <laughs> <laughs> We've got one. It's not part of the normal store. I wouldn't want anyone to cry. Well, I won't. We had this bitch come in, strangled, and held outside a window, all scarred up. That's not her. She's perfect. She told us the owner had gone and lost his mind. <laughs> I love that phrase, lose your mind. <laughs> One day you're drinking coffee, you go to reach for it, like, oh my goodness, wherever did my mind go? <laughs> I, I don't know. Anyway, this sick motherfucker slapped her along the ribs, held her out. Now she's got infections around the midsection. Not eligible for adoption, not yet. Not unless we get one of the good Sam Sam Samaritans. Someone who will really want to bring something back to life. Can I see her? Can you handle seeing her? I'm not a child. <laughs> You're shaking right now. I can look at disgusting things. Oh, this bitch ain't disgusting. <laughs> She's cut up and hurting, but not disgusting. The man who did it to her, that's disgusting. You show me! You're gonna need to sign your name. Here. And here. And this over here. Mm-hmm. Good. And one over there. You can't go cutting corners. Okay, I did it. Now I'm gonna take you to this bitch. There are fines. You, ready to, you sure you're ready to see this bitch? Yes, will you stop calling her that? I call a bitch a bitch. <laughs> Pump slides open a door. <laughs> That's not her. Sage. Oh. How do you know? I'd recognize her spirit. Maybe her spirit up and changed. Oh, he'd never. Lost his mind. It's not her. <sighs> Little miss. <sighs> Little miss. <sighs> hey, Baba. <laughs> Come here. Come here. I want a puppy. I want a puppy. I, I, I downloaded an app, uh, went full hog on it, like, like, like I used to go on the dating apps. Swipe, swipe, swipe. <laughs> Can I see your soul? I, I, I found a little guy, Juno, moon-eyed, nine weeks old. I would love to be nine weeks old <laughs> in someone's arms, you know? Uh, I finally went to the kennel. Uh, I, I don't want to go alone, uh, but I, I said, today is that day. Uh, I expected it to be a junkyard sad, uh, you know, chain link fences, dogs bleeding on gnawed bones, concrete and, uh, and metal and abuse. Instead, uh, it's like a hotel. There's a skylight. <laughs> Volunteers point you to all these rooms, glass rooms. Uh, each room has a dog. Uh, and you look through them, uh, you, can, you can wave, and most of the dogs are, are uh, sleeping, probably, because they're tired of being watched. <laughs> yeah? And, uh, and if you feel a connection, uh, if you feel a connection, you, you can go uh, and make sure that th there's a, a, a card. Uh, sometimes you can go in and touch them. If, if you go, you, you can make sure, and you check the card outside the room. There's a little card with the dog's name, uh, behavioral issues. Uh, uh, it tells you if they're spoken for, like a dance card. It's not a bad life. 
Uh, there are kill shelters, which is, I guess, where they kill you. Um, so that's probably bad. Um, but this wasn't a kill shelter. Some volunteer in, uh, in Taki tried to recruit me, Cam. Uh, I would love to go lie down in one of these rooms, wait for people or, or dogs to ask a volunteer if they could see me, if, if we could be introduced. They'd open the door, uh, and I'd, I'd, uh, I'd lay my head on their lap if we were in love, or, or back into a corner if we weren't. On my card, uh, it would say Pam, Twitch, mostly benign, easily spooked, looking for a good family. End of excerpt. Thank you. <laughs>